Hi, and welcome back to the latest in a series of videos in which I've been building experiments from Charles Platt's Introduction to Electronics Make Electronics. Now, I'm sorry that it's been a while since the last video. I do fit the making of these videos around uh, full-time employment. So as you can imagine, sometimes life commitments do need to take priority. So that being said, let's uh, pick up where we left off and continue with the book's exploration of integrated circuits. Now, you may recall in an earlier experiment, the book introduced us to a decade counter. So this was a decimal counter that counted up the digits from zero to nine and then converted that count into signals to drive a seven segment LED display to show the correct digit. But if you know anything about computing or digital electronics, then you may know that actually it's far easier to represent rather than a decimal or base 10 system to represent a base 2 or binary counting system in a circuit. And that's because there are just two digits to represent, 0 and 1, which we can represent with a low and a high state respectively. So in this experiment, the book is going to introduce us to a new counter, but this counter uses the binary system. It counts in base two. And then we'll see an application of that to create a dice simulator. So let's have a look at that. So the 74HC393 is another counter chip, and it has some similarities to the decade counter integrated circuit that we looked at earlier. And those are that in the top right hand pin is where our power goes in. Um, and this particular chip is looking for five volts DC. It does not want to work with a supply which varies very much from that level. Um, so that's what we need in there. Then again, in the lower left hand pin, we have the ground connection. And then we have two timers and each of those timers has a clock input. And in this case, the clock is looking for a falling edge. So it's looking for that input to be high and then to go from that high state to a low state to trigger the clock. It also has a reset pin so that we can set the count back to zero. And then the next four pins are basically a four bit, that's four binary digits uh, to create a binary number um, that will be the decimal equivalent of zero to 15. And then the pins on the other side basically replicate those functions, but for a second counter. Okay, so let's see what this can do in a circuit. So here we have the circuit which essentially is a 555 timer wired up in a stable mode, which is generating regular pulses to activate the counter, the binary counter. So if I connect the circuit up to power, you can see we have an LED here, which is just flashing to indicate every time we get a pulse from the 555. Uh, and then these LEDs are actually showing the binary digits, uh, the four bit binary digits um, generated by the counter. And we also have a button here that can be used to reset the circuit. So I'm just going to release this now uh, and then I'll let it run through its entire sequence so we can see how that works. So there you go. So here is a very simplified version of the uh, dice simulation circuit from the book. And what we have here is basically seven LEDs arranged in the shape of the pips on the faces of a die. 
we have a 74HE393 counter chip here. And one thing you should notice is only the first three outputs are connected. Uh, that will give us a range of uh, 0 through to 7, which is, of course, enough to cover the range of numbers we have uh, on the face of a die. Um, and this is a simplified diagram. So what I haven't shown here is the supply rails uh, and, of course, the connection to the negative supply rail via current limiting resistors for the LEDs. So you should assume that all those are there. If you want to see the full circuit diagram, you can, of course, see that in the book. But this is enough just to explain how the circuit works. So let's assume that we're starting with the counter set to a count of one. Um, and let's see what's going on with these logic gates that are between the outputs of the counter chip uh, and the LEDs on the die. So for a count of one, only output A will be in a high state. Now you can see this is connected to two places. Firstly, to one of the three inputs to this NOR gate. Now if this was an OR gate, any input being in a high state would of course give us a high output. But remember, this is a NOR gate, so the output is inverted, which means in this case, we get a low output from that NOR gate. So we can ignore that for the moment. The other place that output A is connected to is to the central pip on the die. So that LED will be lit, which gives us our single central pip, which is what we want for the number one. So let's now uh, assume that we're getting a clock to flip the count to the next number, which is two or one zero, as it would be in binary, which means, of course, that now output B is in a high state. Now, once again, output B goes to this three input NOR gate, but the same situation applies here because the output is inverted. We will still get a low output state there so we can ignore it. It's also connected to one of the inputs to this AND gate. But because we've just got a single one of those inputs in a high state, then we're going to get a low output. So again, we can ignore that. The third place that output B is connected to is to one side of this OR gate here. Now, in this case, it's an OR gate, not a NOR gate. So if either or both of the inputs is high, then the output is going to be high. So in this case, the output is high, and that's connected to two LEDs in series on opposite corners of the die, and that's going to give us our two lit pips for the number two. So, so far, so good. Let's now assume another clock signal moves us on to a count of three, or one, one in binary. So here we have a similar... Um, output as we had for state two, but with the addition that because output A is now also high, that is lighting that uh, central pip to give us our three. And note that because we've got still got two high inputs to this NOR gate, because we've still got one low input, we're still going to get a low output there. So we can continue to ignore that. OK, let's now assume another clock input. That's going to move us up to a count of four, which is one zero zero in binary. So now we just have high output from out C. So again, this is connected to three places. One is that NOR gate. Again, we can ignore it. We're not going to get a high output from that at the moment. Also with this AND gate up here, because again, we've just got a single high input. We're not going to get a high output, so we can ignore that. And then the third connection for this pin is to a second OR gate up here. Now, the output from this OR gate is connected to two places. Firstly, it's connected to the two LEDs representing the pips on the opposite corners from the ones that we had lit earlier. So those two will be lit. 
But because it also goes to the second input to this OR gate, it will also light the pips on the other corners. So we get our four. So that's all great. Okay, so now let's move on to five or one zero one in binary. So we've got a similar state to what we had before with C, but now we've added A back into the mix, which is of course connected to this central pip. So that also lights and that gives us our five. Okay, so things are looking good. Let's move on to our last number, which is of course six. Um, and in binary, that is one, one. So, okay, so uh, now we've got both B and C positive, but hang on a second, something is not right here because we're going, we're getting the pips lit for a number four. And what we should be getting is a six. And indeed, if this state persisted for any length of time, then that wouldn't be right. We would be getting an incorrect display for six. But look what else is going on here. Up here now, for the first time, both the inputs to this AND gate are high, which means that the output is now going to be high. And that output is connected to the reset pin. And that, what that will do, of course, is immediately zero all the output pins. So pretty much as soon as we enter this state, we will move immediately on to a state where the output of all of those pins is zero. And this is where finally our NOR gate over here comes in, because now for the first time, all three of those inputs are low. Now remember, if this was an OR gate, that would normally mean that the output is also low. But because this is a NOR gate and the output is inverted, it will, in this case, be high. And this output is connected in two places. Firstly, it's connected to these two central pips, so they will light up. But it's also connected to one side of this chain of OR gates. So the output from both those OR gates is going to be high, which means the corner pips will also be lit and that will give us our six. And then of course, when we get the next clock input, that will move us back to uh, a count of one, which is zero, zero, 001 in binary, and then the whole sequence starts again. So I hope this demonstrates how ingenious the author's design is for using the counter in this way with just the support of just a few logic gates. So let's have a look at this working in the completed circuit. So here is the completed dice circuit and this is intended to simulate rolling a pair of dice. Now a couple of things that are worth pointing out. One is if you've watched any of my previous videos you will know that um, I prefer to have user interface elements like these buttons on a breakout board rather than trying to uh, cram them onto the main circuit board so that is different from the circuit that you'll see in the book that i've done that the other thing that i don't like about this is you can see that unless you're very careful to trim the leads of all your leds what you're going to end up with is exactly what i've got here which is a kind of a sort of random forest of LEDs, um, which doesn't look very satisfactory. Now, obviously one thing you could do is once you've got a working circuit is you could design a nice uh, enclosure for a permanent version of the circuit and that'd be great. But if you just want to improve the look of the circuit on the breadboard, what you can do, uh, and what I've done, is to use a 3D printer to just create these uh, simple little masks here. And these will just fit over the top of the LEDs um, and just hold them in place so that they hold the arrangement uh, of pips on a die, which you can see at the moment they are definitely not doing. So I'm just going to fit those masks on and then we can see how this circuit works.
So here's the circuit with those little 3D printed guides in place and you can see that does a good job, good enough job of holding the LEDs in the right uh, configuration so that they do actually resemble dice. And as you can see at the moment they're both uh, set to show a six. Now if we hold this first button down what we can do is every time we press the second button we can now cycle through um, the different combinations so you can see we go to one here then two then three then four five and six and you can see that that's caused now the the second die to cycle back to one and we can basically carry on to cycle uh, both dies through their sequences so the second one's now to two now to three now to four, five, and finally back to six. Uh, so that shows that everything's wired up correctly. If I release the first button and just use the second button, then now what will happen is each time we press it, we'll just get a different uh, combination um, of numbers on each die. So there you go, that is our dice simulator working well that's certainly been the most complex circuit in the book so far but in the next video it's time to go back to basics a little bit because up to now we've been ignoring a very important aspect of electronics which is that whenever there is a moving electric charge in a circuit it is always accompanied by a magnetic field now, in a lot of circuits, the strength of that magnetic field is very small, uh, and to all intents and purposes, we can ignore it. And in fact, that's what we have been doing up to now. But there are times of circuits where that magnetic field is very important and can be put to work. And so in the next video, we'll have a look at the experiment where the book introduces us to the very important relationship between two aspects of what is known as the electromagnetic force, which is a moving electric charge and a corresponding magnetic field. So please do join me for that.